Welcome to the 04303 Ion Source Alignment Methods video, brought to you by RBD Instruments. We provide innovative products and services to the surface science industry. We'll be looking at the five common methods used to line up ion sources. These include imaging on SiO2 and seeing the beam in real time, burning a hole in a piece of tantalum oxide, imaging through the vacuum viewport on a piece of phosphor, low energy electrons through the spectrometer, and using a Faraday cup. The first method that we're going to look at is using silicon oxide and imaging the ion beam. Step one, let's load a piece of silicon oxide into the system. In this case, we're loading a piece that's about a centimeter square onto a one inch sample puck. Looking at this through the vacuum viewport. Once we dock the sample, we're going to tilt it towards the ion source. Silicon oxide is useful not only for seeing the ion beam, but also for using it for determining what your sputter rate is, because we know the oxide is a known thickness of 1,000 angstroms. Now that we have the sample loaded, we're going to line it to the focal point of the analyzer. In this case, we're using a Phi 15110 CMA. It has a spot size of about 5 microns, which means we won't get very good images, but it will work well enough for the purpose of this video. We position the sample until the crossover of the elastic peak occurs at 2,000 volts. That's now the correct focal point of the CMA. Let's talk a little bit about the theory of the 04303 ion source. It's a hot filament, so the filament gets white hot and electrons are emitted and attracted to the grid. That's our emission current on the 11065 controller. Argon gas is fed into the ionizer area where the argon gas becomes ionized. Those, some of those argon ions are measured by the extractor. That's the pressure on the 11065. The ions are now accelerated down towards the target due to the potential difference of the ionizer which is at the beam voltage of plus 4 kV and the target which is at ground. As the beam passes the condenser lens it's squeezed down or expanded or contracted depending on the voltage that's applied. Same thing with the objective lens. The objective voltage allows you to focus the beam down to a fine point on the target and the deflection plates raster the beam across the surface. Targets at ground, the ionizer is at the beam potential. That's what gives you the potential acceleration voltage. Excess gas is pumped out of the differential port. This table shows some typical parameters for the ion source. With the condenser at the max of 5.0, you get the smallest beam size of about 200 microns and about 150 nanoamps of total current. The other extreme with the condenser at approximately 340, you get about a one millimeter spot size and current anywhere between five to eight microamps. This will vary from source to source. Now that we have the sample loaded, we're going to want to get an image of the sample using the electron gun, typically an SCD image, secondary electron. You're going to set your ion source to these conditions. The condenser is going to be at 5, objective about 3.4, beam voltage at 4, raster off. Set the emission to 25 milliamps and bleed in argon to about 15 millipascals of pressure. When you turn the ion beam on, you're going to see a spot on your TV image, and you will adjust the X and Y thumb screws to center the beam. Here we've turned it on, and you can see that little white spot in the middle. That's the ion beam. As we change the focus, we can get it to go in and out of focus. This uh, particular beam is, uh, has a slight problem with the source. It needs a new aperture, so it's not, it's not very round, but you get the idea. You can see it. We're mechanically moving the beam a little bit now, so we're trying to center it. And once we get it centered, we can also change the raster. Here we're defocusing it. We'll focus it to our sharpest point. Now we can use one raster, one axis at a time, to verify that the raster is working properly. So here, we'll turn on one raster, this axis, and we'll turn that back down to zero. Now we'll go the other axis. So the trick is to make sure that you have enough electron current to see the ion-induced image. This is what the thumb screws look like on the ion source. The trick to remember here is that as you move the source, the beam will move in the opposite direction of the thumb screws. 
Okay, the next method we're going to look at is using tantalum oxide to align the ion beam. In this case, we're going to ascribe an X onto a piece of tantalum oxide and load it into the chamber. I've used an X-Acto knife to scribe an X into a piece that's about a half an inch by a half an inch. We're going to load it into the chamber here. Again, looking in through the vacuum viewport. Once we've docked, we're going to zoom up the mag a little bit so that we can clearly see the X. Okay, so the idea is that we're going to burn a hole in the tantalum. We'll see a blue mark on it as we burn into it. And we're going to try to position the gun to where we hit the X. In this case, we're going to set the condenser to 3.45 so that we can get more current out of the ion source. We'll turn the beam voltage on and after about three minutes or so you'll see a blue spot begin to appear. That says we're burning through the oxide layer on the tantalum. And then you'll want to estimate which position, which direction you need to move the source a little bit. And so you adjust the thumb screws. The thing to remember is if you want to move the nose up and to the left, you have to move the thumb screws back and to the right. It, the, the source pivots about where the flange is. So we'll move it a little bit, we'll turn the beam back on, and here we can see now we've kind of made a fairly good guess. We're a little bit closer to the X, as you can see with the second blue spot that's closer to the X. Now we'll let this burn through for a little bit longer so that you can see that after about five minutes or so we'll be all the way through the oxide and we should have be back down to the metal in which case we'll see like a blue ring and there it is so we can see that after five minutes or so you know exactly where you are so with a few iterations of moving the, the source you should be able to easily dial it in directly on the X and you can also fine-tune the focus of the source for the smallest possible size the next method is using phosphor to line the ion beam. In this case, we just load a piece of phosphor into the system and set it to the focal point of the analyzer. And then just turn the ion beam on. You'll see it fluorescing on the phosphor through the viewport. We can change the focus to make the beam larger or smaller and also adjust the position of the beam by changing the mechanical position of the ion gun. Here we've turned the instrument light off so that we can get a better look. That's the ion beam glowing on the sample. When you use this method, you're actually destroying the phosphor. So it's only going to last for so many minutes. So you have to keep that in mind. You don't have all day when you're doing this technique, or you just burn up your phosphor and you move to a fresh area and eventually put a new piece in. You can see that black area that's becoming discolored in the center there. The next method is using low energy electrons to align the ion beam. In this case, we're going to position the sample to the focal point of the analyzer, turn on the ion beam, and we're going to monitor low energy electrons that are induced by the ion beam. So we set up an alignment. In this case, it's a kinetic of 0 to 100 because we're using an OJ analyzer. And we get a low energy ion induced peak. And we just simply adjust the mechanical x and y on the ion source and also adjust the condenser and focus to optimize this to get the highest possible counts. You may have to adjust your multiplier voltage down as well to keep your multiplier from saturating. If you're using this with an XPS system, you're going to want to have an analysis area of about one millimeter. This is a very useful technique. It's very easy to do. Once we get it centered here and dialed into the max, we just lock our thumb screws down and we have it aligned. The final method is using a Faraday cup to align the beam. First, we load a Faraday cup in and align it to the focal point of the analyzer. As you can see, once we load the sample, and we'll zoom up a little bit in magnification, the Faraday cup is actually a 250 micron size hole in the center of the sample puck that little tiny hole there in the center. That's, that's what we're going to put the ion beam into. So, 
after we've put it in and if we've adjusted the focal point, we set the condenser to the nom nominal value for maximum current, 3.45 on the condenser, 3.6 on the objective. We turn the ion beam on, and we're going to monitor the target current just to make sure that we're getting the, proc the, the correct current. Typically, this is going to be somewhere between 5 to 6 or 7 microamps of current. And I'm adjusting my pressure down a little bit now, and that's going to reduce the current. But we can see that, yes, we're getting approximately 5 microamps of current, so that means that the ion gun is working properly, and I'm getting a lot of current. Next up, what we're going to do is we're going to try focusing that current into the Faraday cup. Before we do that, we need to ground the target and move the, the picoammeter lead to the ion lead on the specimen stage. The way this works is the ion beam is much larger than the 250 micron hole, and only the ions that make it through that little hole make it into the Faraday cup where they're counted. So whereas we're hitting the target with about 5 to 6 microamps of current, we're going to get a much smaller amount of current into the Faraday cup. Typically that amount of current is going to be between 100 to 300 or so um, nanoamps. So this schematic shows the concept. So we turn the ion beam on. We're going to adjust the condenser objective and mechanical on the ion source to maximize the current into the Faraday cup. And we turn it on. Now I'm moving the mechanical X a little bit and Y a little bit to try to maximize the counts. Adjusting the condenser and the objective. So what we're doing is we're focusing as much of the ion current as we possibly can get into that little 250 micron hole. And so what we're doing really is we're optimizing the current density of the source in addition to aligning it up. And there we go. Now we've got it lined up and it's stable. Okay, to summarize, we've looked at these methods. Silicon oxide, imaging the ion beam, burning a hole in tantalum oxide, imaging through the viewport with phosphor, using a low energy peak, and the Faraday cup. We provide these parts as replacements for the 04303 ion source, the ionizer and the differential aperture. We also provide a rebuild service for the 06350 ionizer, which is a very similar ion source as the 04303. Here's a picture of the 04303 ionizer. This is something that's very easy to replace by the user in the field. This is the differential aperture. This is not as easy to replace by the user in the field, but it could be done. Generally, though, we replace this aperture when we provide the complete rebuild service of the entire source as part of one of our factory repair services. Sputter standards provided by RBD include a silicon oxide wafer of 1,000 angstroms, tantalum oxide, 1,000 angstroms, and a 3 by 3 inch piece of phosphor. Phosphor is useful for general purpose alignment. The other standards are used not only for alignment, but also for calibration of the sputter rates of your ion source. For more information on the products and services that we provide related to the 04303 ion source, please visit our website at rbdinstruments.com. We also have technical information related to the alignment procedures that were shown in this video. Thank you.